hello everyone. I am Mirsad Kriestrats and I am joining you from South Florida. I am um, a senior researcher at the Bratislava based Minority Issues Research Institute, also known by its acronym of MIRI. Our MIRI is dedicated on working towards promoting and protecting human and minority rights in Slovakia and abroad. We believe in the importance of research, education, and active involvement in shaping a more just societies. As a part of our activities, we hold monthly conversations with experts and people around the world about the important international affairs. Today, our eyes are on the U European Union borderland of, um, of Moldova and um, the developments in and around that geopolitically important Eastern European country. It is my pleasure to um, uh, to moderate today's discussion with our two Moldovian guests, Dr. Siku Octavian, who is faculty at the Institute of History Acad at the Academy of Science of the Republic of Moldova, and Ekaterina Sheik, a member of Moldovian diaspora, in the United States, who now lives in the greater metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. Uh, the young East European country of Moldova has a rich history and important geostrategic location. The country of about 2.6 million people lies between the Romanian Carpathian Mountains in the west and the plains of Ukraine in the north and east, further extending uh, deep into Russia. It is part of the Black Sea Basin, which Moldova reaches with two large rivers. In 2002, Moldova was granted a candidate status by the European Union, while at the end of 2023, they also began formal succession talks. An open, um, um, an open path to the European Union also provided constitutionally neutral country a way to further orient itself towards a more comprehensive Euro-Atlantic integration, including even possible military cooperation and coordination with NATO. They tried to do that reproachment with NATO step by step, and in 2017, in response to a request from the authorities of the Republic of Moldova, NATO opened its first liaison office to serve as the official diplomatic mission and as a representation of the alliance in Moldova. The office is based in the capital, Chisinau, and it plays an important role in furthering NATO-Moldova relations. But when the current Moldovian president, president indicated interest in broadening their cooperation with NATO and even possibility of joining the alliance, the anti-NATO protests erupted in the country and forced the Moldovan foreign minister after a few weeks to publicly state that his country is not pursuing NATO membership due to the limited public backing. As a country with two large opposition groups, two large opposing groups of mostly speaking Russian speaking Slavs and Romanian uh, speaking ethnic Moldovans, it is actually unclear which group is against such move. Moldova's population is fairly divided due to its history when it was under the Soviet rule, when number of Russian troops were settled in the areas along the Ukrainian border among uh, other older local native Slavic groups. The Slavic speaking groups dominated area uh, called Transistria even fought a secessionist war shortly after Moldova declared its independence. And because of its backing by Russia, they declared formal separation and independence from the Republic of Moldova in 1992, which no country has recognized thus far. They're still about a thousand Russian soldiers stationed in that breakaway Transnistria region, situated with the Dniestre River on the one side and the Ukrainian border on the other. In addition to that, 
uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the small country of Moldova has received thousands of Ukrainian refugees, which puts an additional strain on the country's infrastructure, economy, and increases internal political tensions. Yet, at the same time, many point that due to Ukraine's resilience, the Republic of Moldova is currently still in a state of peace. Essentially, Ukraine's ability to withstand brutal Russian aggression thus far helps maintenance of peace in the Republic of Moldova. But the big question is looming of what will happen with Moldova if with the current constellation of forces and territorial divisions there. Despite um, all those serious challenges in and around the Republic of Moldova, there is not much information about the countries coming directly from, uh, directly as the Moldovian perspective, available to wider public in Europe and beyond. Recognizing this problem, Miri have invited Dr. Octavian Siku to help us understand the political and historical context of the country, and Ekaterina Sheik, who is going to talk about the perceptions, concerns, and hopes of ordinary Moldovans in diaspora and back home in light of the anticipated transitional difficulties and challenges that the country is facing. Dr. Octavian Siko is the Associate Professor at the Moldovian State University and the University of Bucharest in Romania. Um, he was also a member of Moldavian Parliament from 2019 to 2021, a Minister of Youth and Sport in 2013, and he had other kind of important political and social engagements. Um, okay. Um, Dr. Tsiku is an author and a co-author of 15 books about Moldovan history, culture, and post-Soviet regional interactions published in the European Union and Moldova. Among his latest works is his book on Soviet-era identity construction in Moldova in Romanian language, and he also wrote uh, many books and articles about soccer as a tool of politics. He lives and works in the capital of Moldova, Chisinau, and he's joining us from there. Uh, Ekaterina Shea is originally from Moldova, and she moved to the United States in 2008. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the university here in the United States, as well as an associate degree in law from the University of European Studies back in Moldova. Currently, she's teaching in elementary school in the United States, states in the state of Virginia. Ekaterina grew up speaking Romanian and Russian, and she also speaks English, French, and Spanish. And finally, to repeat the code of conduct for our event, and as usual for this type of seminars, we are going to first hear the presentation by our guests for about half an hour. And after that, we will open the discussion for the questions and answers. If you want to ask your question in person, you're welcome to. Please just raise your the hand icon and we will call upon you. Once your microphone on, please introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from and then ask your questions. Those of you who cannot join over the microphone, you're welcome to type in your questions in the chat box and we will try to ask them on your behalf. Thank you for your cooperation. Let's please keep the microphone off um, so that we don't disturb the presenters. And now let us turn our attention to Dr. Tsiku. Dr. Tsiku, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mirsad. I really enjoyed uh, your introduction and thank you for this uh, kindly presentation of uh, Moldova. It's my way uh, in some way to return to the United States after to my experience, wonderful experience in the United States in 1996 and 2006, 2007. Um, I would like to be helpful and uh, useful for uh, our audience. I, uh, and I will start probably by saying uh, that Moldova is a small country indeed. 
but uh, this is a unique state in Europe and probably in the world. And this is uh, because of some uh, paradoxes of our situation. So just imagine a country where we teach uh, the history of Romanians, but the uh, majority of the population, 75% uh, consider themselves Moldovans. And um, next, uh, imagine we teach uh, Romanian language and literature in our schools, universities, but our uni our constitution provides, according to the 13 article, that uh, the state language is a Moldova language. Uh, next, uh, as you said, uh, we are a neutral country, according to the constitution, but 10% of uh, territory is occupied by Russian forces, and uh, which uh, deny any relevance to neutrality of Moldova. In the same time, we have uh, two churches. We are Orthodox, but we, we have two churches. The one church is the uh, metropolis of Bessarabia is affiliated to Romanian patriarchy. And the Nova metropolis of Moldova is uh, attached to patriarchy of Moscow, Russian Federation. In the same time, we have two New Year's and we have two Christmases. Because people celebrate in uh, all the new style uh, had, uh, as Romanians or as uh, Orthodox Russian Orthodox. Uh, the paradox is, uh, the next paradox is, uh, of course, we reached the status of uh, a candidate state to European Union. That's wonderful new. But in the same time, we are a member of community of independent states, which is in the Russian control. This is quite a unique situation because uh, nowhere, no one of the post-Soviet country which reached the candidate status uh, has the same situation. And um, last uh, but not least, uh, since we are at the institute which deal with minorities, we have a large part of minority, around 20%. But our minority are not typical minority, European minority. They are the largest minority, Ukrainians, then Gagauz, Turkish minority, then Russian. Russians are only 4% of population. But in this way, uh, it's very strange, but uh, almost all minority, they are Russian speaker and they uh, gravitate to the Russian world, not to the, how to say, uh, motherlands, as Ukrainians, as Turkish or Bulgarian, and uh, so on. And why, uh, and when we ask uh, why this uh, happened, why so many paradoxes and why this situation happened, it's, the answer is uh, simple. Because uh, from the beginning of 19th century till the middle of 20th century, so almost in 150 years, uh, Moldova and parts of this territory were uh, exchange between Romania and uh, Russia, Soviet Union, seven times. So seven times uh, parts of Moldova or Moldova itself were uh, with Romania or with Russia uh, and or uh, Soviet Union. So people lost everything, political regime changed, uh, followed by uh, changes in, uh, in uh, demographic construction and so on. Um, the most dramatic was, of course, the Soviet uh, experience, because the Soviet Union turned the Romanians into Homo Moldovanus. This is the title of my book, The Soviet Homo Moldovanus, which is a uh, identity constructions of Romanians against Romanians. And uh, at this moment, uh, even if we are almost majority in Republic of Moldova, Moldovans and Romanians, 82%, according to the last census, the situation is not so clear because uh, we are divided across this uh, perception uh, on the state 
and nation building. To put it simply, when we started the way to national removal in 1980s, 1990s against the Moscow and the Soviet Union, um, the only normal way, and this were the dem demons, was the reunification with Romania. And uh, it uh, was uh, the main article of uh, Popular Front, uh, which was the vehicle of changes against the Soviet center. Uh, we were in a very, very good relation with Baltic states at that moment. We follow the same path. Baltic wanted independence. We wanted to reunificate with Romania. And uh, after independence, which was considered to be a step toward the reunification of Romania, started the war. In 1992, Moldova faced the same situation as Ukraine. Now, uh, Moldova was attacked by a separatist Russian pact army. Uh, the 14 Russian army supported the separatists from the uh, left part of the uh, Nistru River, which is was considered to be part of the Russian world. And after a very short confrontation, but uh, very fierce, thousands of people died in this war. Moldova lost control uh, over this territory, which emerged into Moldovan uh, Transnistrian Republic, which is uh, not under the control of Moldova, which is controlled totally by Russian Federation. And uh, from this perspective, uh, Republic of Moldova is divided between uh, three big uh, nation building projects, which are uh, based on a different, three different perspective on history. The first uh, current, uh, which is powerful intellectually and uh, among people, is a pro-Romanian unionist uh, current. Uh, this nation-building uh, project want uh, reunification of uh, Romania. Uh, most of uh, universities, uh, teachers, professors, and large segment of population, according to uh, pulls uh, around 40% of population uh, at that moment want uh, reunification of Romania. Um, we succeed to preserve history of Romanians and Romanian language, but um, after the war in Transnistria, Russia changed the political landscape. The neo-communists uh, retake power from a nationalist of a Popular Front in 1994. And Moscow uh, imposed the constitution which was against the interest of Republic of Moldova. Some of these uh, uh, articles are quite against the Republic of Moldova, like uh, neutrality, the language, and Gagauz, uh, autonomy inside of Republic of Moldova, which is under the Russian control. So we are facing two separatism in Republic of Moldova. One which is outside the control, another which is part of Moldova, but uh, very pro-Russian and anti-Moldova. So uh, after 1994, it was uh, restored the uh, so-called Moldovanist uh, uh, current, which was based on the Soviet uh, past. They wanted Moldova to be separate. They considered that Moldovans and Romanians are two different people, two nations, uh, since uh, they have some common history, but uh, distinct uh, future, that uh, we speak Moldovan language and want to be mostly with Russian Federation and uh, to be friendly with Russians to have multi-victorial uh, policy and so on. In the same time, we have a third uh, nation building pro project from Transnistrian region. This separatist region was coined uh, far away, far time ago, it was in the 18th, 18th century, it's long history. But basically the name Moldova, 
uh, derived from uh, Moldovan state of Romania, which was which largest part is in Romania now. But the Soviet coined this name in the left bank of Nistru River outside. And this uh, strip uh, was built in 1924. So it's 100 years since uh, this uh, separatist regime, uh, re regime uh, origin. And uh, the idea of this project is transnistrization of Moldova. What, what mean transnistrization is the total control of politics in Chisinau and Moldova through federalization of Moldova. Um, the plan of uh, Mr. Kozak in 2003, which was uh, named by Putin to be responsible with this federalization, was to create in Moldova three federal entities, Transnistrian, Gagauz, and uh, Moldova, with equal votes to have Russian language as state language, and to keep uh, Russian uh, forces for another uh, 40 years. And uh, this project uh, is still available because it was pushed by Russian Federation every time when discussion to solve this uh, conflict appeared. What changed meanwhile in 2009, uh, Moldova actually in 30 years faced uh, uh, six, eight time the change of power from east to west. So our elections are not elections based on uh, uh, ideology, on uh, wealth, on uh, someone, uh, social issue and so on. Our elections are geopolitical. So when pro-European, pro-Romanians won, when uh, pro-Russians, uh, pro-Putinists. So this change in uh, and uh, preferences uh, mean the change of uh, uh, political design because uh, pro-Russians party, they control it many times, the parliament, the government. And uh, we faced uh, two authoritarian regime. One was in 2001-2009, and over from 2016 to 2019. One authoritarian regime was led by a former internal affairs minister of Soviet uh, Union, Mr. Voronin, who was actually uh, an reformed communist and who ruled desperately this uh, country for eight years. And the Nover was uh, backed uh, by uh, noble intentions of pro-European integration, but was an oligarchic regime of Mr. Plahotniuk. So uh, this is, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, how Moldova evolved till uh, the war in Ukraine in 2022. Uh, fortunately, in 2020, we succeed to gain the power uh, of pro-democratic, pro-European forces. For the first time in Moldova, a real pro-European uh, leader, uh, took power, Maya Sandu, who was uh, the exponent of pro-European uh, uh, party of uh, solidarity in action. And um, during this uh, decade from 2009 till 2022, grew up a new uh, current of, uh, on the Republic of Moldova, a new nation building project, which is based on uh, Moldovan European identity. So. Uh, we are Moldovan, we speak Moldova, we speak Romanian language, but uh, we want to be part of European Union as an independent state. And uh, this uh, is another uh, nation building project. It is uh, strong because me, many times even unionists vote for these uh, parties which claim pro-European independent approach. And uh, now we have a situation with a pro-European party, which is, uh, which is uh, in power. It's for the first time in our 30 years when a pro-European political party uh, got uh, power absolutely. So they control parliament, uh, government, presidency. And what helped Moldova to stay uh, stable in the context of war in Ukraine? Uh, when the war started uh, in uh, February 24, 
Moldova was very cautious in uh, taking radical uh, measure against Russian Federation. For instance, we accepted uh, the Ukrainian refugees, but we didn't comply to European sanctions against Russian Federation. We said this is dangerous because we depend on Russian uh, gas and Russia could uh, uh, cut us electricity from uh, because from an energetical point of view, we are totally depending on Russia. Uh, they provide us gas and they provide us energy from Transnistrian region. And um, that's why we were very uh, careful. We uh, uh, supported Ukraine. Uh, we accepted uh, uh, to be vocal in terms of supporting Ukraine, but we haven't accepted, for instance, to condemn uh, the occupation of Transnistrian region by European Parliament. Everything changed after uh, two months or three months when it was clear that Ukraine will resist. And when U Ukraine showed uh, the, the power and strength, Moldova became courageous. And uh, we started uh, to be more and more anti-Russian. We were uh, invited to the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2023, uh, where Moldova was assured to be uh, helped. In 2023, Moldova, for the first time, organized the European political uh, summit, the summit of community of uh, European political uh, uh, community. It was uh, in June 2023. Moldova got the uh, candidate status in 2022, and uh, later we became a candidate state uh, in this uh, autumn. Um, we took a decisive measure against uh, uh, the opposition party, which tried to destabilize Moldova. To put it shortly, uh, and to uh, counteract some myth regarding the invasion of Moldova, Putin is not interested in a war in Moldova. He wanted uh, one election in Moldova. He have a very strong political parties like Socialist Party, led by uh, Igor Dodon, the former president, uh, by Communist Party, led by former president, uh, Mr. Voronin by the party of uh, oligarch Ilan Shor, who is uh, in Russian Federation now, which is the most uh, uh, dangerous political party from point of view of destabilization. And even the political party of the actual mayor of Chisinau, Ivan Ceban, who portrayed as pro-European, but he is a real Putinist, because he previously was member of Communist and Socialist Party. So uh, Russia has a political party which tried to secure the elections. First, the presidential elections, but in Moldova, the presidential elections are important, but not decisive because we are a parliamentary republic and the most of the power is centered in parliament. So if you have parliament, you have majority, you form government, and you can even suspend the president if he is not signing the decrees. So it happened many times with the previous president Dodon, which was opposite to this oligarch. He was suspended five or six times. And that moment, the president of parliament, the speaker of parliament is the president of country and he can do everything he wants. So the idea of Putin is, uh, to put pressure on Moldova, to use the destabilization, the situation in which uh, Moldova is a poor country. And in this poorness, um, the Putinist party uh, tried to explain this difficulty with European integration. They say we don't need the European integration because European integration uh, make us poor and dependent. We will lose our sovereignty. Um, is a much accent of uh, 
imaginary independence and sovereignty of Moldova, which of course is not respected first of all by Russian Federation, but this is another question. They said that Moldova is used as an instrument by NATO and uh, by uh, Western powers against Russia. Uh, of course, they speak about Soros uh, as a foundation which is uh, conspirational against Republic of Moldova. And many, many others propaganda issue that actual uh, government actually is a marionette of Western power of uh, United States and so on. Propaganda is very quite powerful in Moldova because, because uh, it was based on a Soviet propaganda of uh, anti-Western, anti-Romanian, uh, especially anti-Romanian because uh, Putinist propaganda uh, explicitly say that uh, Romania is the most dangerous because they wanted to take back uh, this uh, republic to make union, to an exit, as it was many times ago. So uh, uh, Putin focused on these elections. He focused against the referendum, which is planned this year. So we have a, a referendum in October, a referendum, a constitutional referendum uh, to be part of European Union. And uh, all these guns of propaganda against this referendum, they boycott it and to show to the world that Moldovans, they don't want to be in the European Union. Uh, the propaganda of uh, Kremlin is uh, based on idea that uh, if a referendum will fail, if uh, the government, uh, the pro-Europeans will lose elections, this is a proof that Moldovans want to be with Russian Federation, to have cheaper gas, to export the um, benefits on the Russian market, uh, to be in a friendship, secular friendship with Russian Federation and so on. Uh, that's why uh, this uh, two years are crucial, this year and next year are crucial for the future of Republic of Moldova. What are the scenarios? Uh, because everything is depending on the war in Ukraine. Uh, briefly, very three scenarios of the future. The first one is a positive one. Ukraine will uh, won this uh, war. The Putinist regime uh, will be defeated. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine will be became part of European Union and NATO and Moldova will succeed to integrate this separatist region and uh, uh, favorable to Moldova conditions as unitary state and Moldova to became part of a European Union. This is a consensual uh, approach because uh, we succeeded to reconciliate pro-European and unionist, so-called pro-Romanians and pro-Europeans, and to say that uh, either union of Romania or integration in the European Union, union is the same thing. So this is a happy end, I would say. The tragic uh, scenarios, the happy one, is Ukraine will be defeated Russian Federation will reach Nistru River, Odessa, south of Bessarabia, and they will succeed to join with Transnistrian separatists and uh, will invade Moldova. What happened, as I told you seven times in our history, so we are prepared to this action and we have to take into consideration what will happen in this uh, case. Most probably will be the scenarios of 100 years ago, or a Romanian and NATO army will enter into Moldova, or Russian Federation will occupy Moldova. So uh, we will have a couple of hours, days or hours, to decide to be with Russia or with Romania and the European Union. Uh, recently, Romania adopted a new a new strategy of uh, foreign policy. And they pointed explicitly a point, which of course was coordinated with allies in NATO, to defend Romanians uh, outside Romania. 
Just to remind you, in Moldova, there are uh, one million of Romanian citizens, because like me, I'm a Romanian citizen from 1993. Because Romania keep uh, Romanian citizenship for everyone who was, were born in uh, uh, previous to the Second World War. So uh, Romania and NATO and European Union will have uh, this uh, challenge what to do if Russia will reach uh, Transnistrian region and uh, will invade Republic of Moldova. And of course, the last scenarios, which is status quo, this means the frozen of the conflict in Ukraine, a large frozen conflict with uh, status quo territoriale, Ukraine will not succeed to defeat Russia and to return its territory. Uh, Ukraine and Moldova will be a gray zone, uh, no European Union, no NATO, no uh, integration because uh, of the problems which Russia will have, the control which will have in this territory uh, through separatist regions, through integration of this territory into Russian Federation, and to maintain as long uh, as possible the uncertainty in order to keep NATO and European Union far away from Moldova and Ukraine. That was uh, my presentation. And if you have, have question, I'm ready to ask. Excellent. Uh, very good, uh, Dr. Uh, Tiku. I learned myself a lot. And there is indeed a lot of uh, questions, at least uh, from me and I'm sure from others. But before we open the questions and answers, Let's hear the view from, as we said, ordinary Moldovans, right? Where Ekaterina will try to um, try to uh, um, the ordinary Moldovans see the current moment in which it, their country is. Ekaterina, please take over. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, as Dr. Mirsad mentioned, as an ordinary Moldovan, um, I would just. Uh, I would like to talk about some um, concerns that we have, the Moldovan diaspora, the concerns that we are facing today. And um, on the topic of uh, possible Russian invasion or Russian um, um, taking over, um, first of all, uh, it, this, this possibility makes me very sad and of course worries me and other Moldovans immensely. Uh, because of um, having my family and um, my friends still living in Moldova, I cannot imagine how devastated this could be. And as any other nation in the world, uh, possibility of a war is uh, could is devastating. Just the thought of a war, and um, one. I guess what what gives me another um, hope is seeing that uh, now with the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine, we are Moldova is getting more attention and um, it is getting more support from European Union and uh, has been promised support. And we understand as ordinary Moldovans that this attention is actually crucial at the moment and ordinary people understand that this lack of attention from European Union and from the world could result in Moldova going back to a Russian oppression, like un under Russian umbrella again. Um, I left Moldova 16 years ago and I can see that much has progressed in Moldova. Um, there are many more education opportunities. There is uh, there are many more economical opportunities for people living there. And while Moldova is not part of the European Union yet, at times this opportunities and um, uh, flexibility for travel opportunities again for um, education makes it feel like Moldova is part of the uh, European European Union at times, and of course. Again, with that risk of um, an invasion or um, Russian um, taking over again, 
we are facing um, Moldova going back to the times prior of me leaving Moldova. And it will certainly hurt its people in so many ways. Um, Moldova's ambition to join the European Union has given its citizens so many open doors and um, economical stability um, and growth. And um, a Russian dominance can take that only chance away for a farther, uh, a farther development of Moldova. Uh, here, I would like to mention that uh, Russian dominance and aggression played an important role in shaping the generation I grew up in and I am part of. Um, after the Soviet Union collapsed, a Russian language remained um, as a second language. And in schools, a Russian language was not an optional language, as here many other languages are optional, and you get to choose uh, what you would like to learn. Um, in Moldova, Russian language was a required language. Um, moreover, interviewing and asking other people, uh, my friends, my family, uh, people back home, uh, on this topic of a Russian of uh, language, many Moldovans mentioned to me various incidents when they were uh, told or made fun of um, for not speaking a perfect Russian language. Um, for instance, one of my friends mentioned that uh, when she would speak Romanian language in, a, in an area with uh, a do dominated Russian speakers, um, People will even tell her that this is not the human language and you should be speaking Russian. So this sentiment of Russian language being superior um, always persisted and felt during my time living in Moldova. And I strongly believe that um, this played also a role in um, our social confidence as a generation and gave us that social awareness when um, around other people. So um, this also, I think, played a role in uh, us growing up. Um, we, we were not provided, because of the Russian dominance, we were not provided that opportunity to discover and determine uh, who, we, who we are as a nation. And, um, the ongoing Russian propaganda and retaining the dominance always prevented that psychological national development for Moldovans. Russian propaganda prevented us from uh, freely and openly talk about our Romanian roots in general. Um, again, for my generation, um, people growing up um, in my time being in Moldova, a turning point was in 2002 when the Communist Party proposed to make Russian language, language compulsory and proposed to ban Romanian and Latin languages in schools. So, uh, moreover, they proposed to ban uh, Romanian history books and recreate and write Moldovan history. I still remember the day when I was a student at um, College of um, Republic Republican College of Information. Um, my history professor just told us, you have to make your voice heard. Um, I want to also note here that uh, the Communist Party won the re-election in 2009, and the only uh, the only president who congratulated them back then was uh, the president of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev. Um, so going back to the 2002, the turning point for me and my generation, um, the that proposed 
ban of Latin languages in school and changing Russian languages, the main language and changing the history resulted in a big protest. And I, part I personally participated um, uh, opposing um, that thought. And I um, also, I think that protest was uh, the fear of losing our only opportunity to become a democratic or pro-Western nation. And that protest has certainly shaped my generation in a historical way. So I believe that uh, that's when we, many Moldovans, uh, young Moldovan students, realized how powerful our voice can become. And um, we realized that we can make us, uh, we can make ourselves heard. So for many that protests, um, for journalists, for example, it was a protest against the freedom of speech. For others was a protest against rigged elections. And um, for many students, was the protest against new uh, new parliament who denied a common history and a common language with Romania. And unfortunately, that debate still exists today, as um, Dr. Tiku mentioned as well. And in large part, is that debate is coming from vast majority of politicians who are sponsored by Russia and they are in Russia's pocket. So um, here to, to sum it up a little bit, um, 22 it has been 22 years in the, since that turning point and since that revolution um, in 2002. And I believe that today the most pow uh, powerful tool to facilitate Moldova's progression is to have our voice heard. And ordinary Moldovans want stability. And they and that stability can only be accomplished by affiliation with modern Western nations. And um, Moldovan diaspora is ready to assist in any ways possible uh, to make our voices heard. Um, I am glad to have the opportunity to be heard today. Um, as an ordinary Moldovan and speak from an ordinary Moldovan point of view. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katerina. That was a very important uh, addition to what uh, Professor Tsiku spoke about because people can actually see that uh, it, is, it is indeed not just academic discussion, not a, a discussion on the level of politicians and you know, high politic political uh, discussion, but it is also a concern of ordinary people who actually are recipients of this, how you say, these decisions made on the upper level. And being that we are a minority issues research institute, voices like yours are extremely valuable. And so now we can open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, please, if you have any questions, just raise your hand icon and uh, uh, after we, you turn your, mic, your microphone on, just introduce yourself, tell us where you're coming, joining us from, and go ahead and ask a question. Okay, uh, while we are waiting for our, uh, uh, our guests to, to, to come up with the questions, I have a question for uh, Professor Siku, if, if, if it's okay. Um, uh, Professor Tiku, you said uh, in your presentation that, um, I mean, several different things. And what interests me uh, a lot is um, that uh, total dependence on, on, on Russian sources of, of gas and energy by Moldova, uh, how that uh, dependence is affected by the war in Ukraine. Did that serve as an opportunity for Moldova to find alternative sources, and uh, which I guess is unintended consequence? And uh, as I have uh, shared an article with you just recently, I read how 
although I received the first, I believe they call it extra, experimental batch of the liquid gas from the United States. I, um, and so that may open a possibility for um, for a for energy independence of the country, which I guess will be extremely important in future developments. And then what also uh, struck me, and you pointed to that paradox as well, is that uh, um, uh, that Moldova is, is now being granted a candidate status in, in the European Union, but it is also a member of the of this uh, uh, block of former Soviet states, which is dominated by Russia. So if this uh, conversation with the European Union progresses, and if that close um, closeness to European Union continues, does that mean that Moldova will stop being part of this other, uh, how you say, organization? Is it either or, or is it uh, uh, there is a chance for end? What is your assessment? Can can both of them continue, or one needs to end for other one to continue? I will start with the last part. Is one should stop, of course. We deny the more than twenty agreements uh, with community of independent states of this parliament, but this parliament still has no uh, political will to went out from the community of independent states. This is probably a mental, uh, mental uh, faiblesse, how to say. I don't know, uh, because, uh, because uh, it's uh, obvious that we should to, to start negotiation of European Union. And uh, this requirement of European Union uh, against uh, the rules of community of independent states and uh, is opposite uh, even if uh, this community of independent states uh, just to remind you it was created by uh, ukraine uh, belarusians and russia then it was uh, added uh, 13 uh, 12 11 11 republics except baltics and georgia and now uh, georgia left ukraine left uh, moldova still there and probably we will uh, leave it as soon as possible. I, I hope after the next elections, when uh, I'm sure the pro-European majority will secure the, the votes. Uh, concerning the energy sector, uh, my observation, long, the longest lasting observation, we should to integrate uh, the energetical system of Moldova into that of Romania. Because Romania has gas, Romania has uh, nuclear plants, Romania has centrals, it's uh, self-sufficient. Why uh, no one uh, wanted it uh, for 30 years? It is obvious because Gazprom strategically corrupted our uh, elites. They paid uh, this million billion to our uh, president's prime minister. Uh, one of our minister of economy was a former KGB agent and he, uh, after he invited uh, uh, Rogozin uh, and he was developed by our secret services and he said, well, I'm proud that I'm, uh, I was KGB agent. And he was the one who uh, was against uh, the gasoduct uh, Romania Republic of Moldova. It was built for 10 years uh, just because one uh, single man uh, he was against. And uh, Russia and uh, uh, any cost, they tried to stay monopolist. And basically, not only because they wanted to have control on Moldova. Actually, this region of Transnistria, which is 10% uh, of our territory and population, um, they have, uh, they use too much, uh, too more, too, two times more gas than the Republic of Moldova. And they uh, use this gas for big enterprises and to electric station in Kuchurgan, and then sell uh, this energy to Republic of Moldova. They don't pay for gas. 
all this uh, gas, uh, depths of gas uh, put on Moldova side and Republic of, Republic of Moldova own uh, now to Gazprom uh, more than eight uh, billion dollars, which means the budget of Republic of Moldova for uh, six or seven years. So uh, they use gas that they don't pay and this is put on Moldova debt. And actually Gazprom and the energy sector uh, is the sponsor of separatist regime. So uh, from my perspective, and our government started to build uh, electric uh, lines between Moldova and Romania in a very fast way to connect Republic of Moldova to alternative sources. Indeed, your question is good because uh, mainly we're in Ukraine changing. Because the actual power previously to the war, they signed a new agreement with Gazprom for five years. And only this war uh, changed mind. So uh, it, it was a via this actual government has no, uh, uh, has no any reason to change this situation because the agreement with Gazprom was signed for five years. But uh, in a couple of months started the war and everything changed. And for the first time, we we reached uh, gas uh, from Poland, United States, Romania, and from over country alternative. So uh, Republic of Moldova is not anymore depending on Russian gas. We are more or less independent. And what is important is cheaper. I don't hear you, Mirsa. I said, is the gas from from Russia? Did it came through through pipeline, or it, it was uh, how, how was the gas previously? Pipelines, pipelines, pipeline. Is that pipeline now working still, even though during? Yes, the it is. It is work, and the paradox, uh, which usually people think that gas came from Transnistria to Moldova, no, it's uh, opposite. Moldova provide gas to Transnistria. So even in this case, we have no interest to negotiate with Russian Federation to say you have to pay for this transition of gas to Transnistrian region and you have to pay for this gas. Okay, that's that's uh, quite interesting that despite the war, the, the pipeline is still op operating uh, and yeah. neither Russians nor the Ukrainians uh, did anything to disturb that, uh, how you say what is, what is war? Business is business. Exactly, yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Surova, please uh, go ahead, ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Um, good day to everyone. As Mirsa said, uh, my name is Satusha Surova and uh, I'm from Miri. First of all, I would like to thank uh, to, to Dr. Octavian and Ekaterina uh, for their valuable contributions today to, to our Miri seminar. And secondly, I would like to ask a question. Uh, it is uh, the same question for both of you. So uh, I'm curious in the light of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and different possible scenarios of ending this horrible war, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Titsu has uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I'm wondering, does Moldova uh, thinks about uh, um, reconsidering its uh, military uh, neutrality? And uh, uh, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, uh, what political elites and uh, uh, have what political elites um, 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 uh, think about this? Uh, are they thinking about closer cooperation with NATO or even maybe membership? And also, I'm wondering what kind of support for these um, changes uh, there are among uh, ordinary citizens. Thank you. I will tell you. A personal experience, what mean to be a supporter of NATO integration. In 2020, I was the only candidate to presidential election in Moldova, which had uh, NATO integration as a, as a point. 
and I got two percent of uh, voters. Of course, <laughs> not only this uh, issue was important, but is important that no one of the rest of seven or uh, six uh, candidates uh, put this on the, the in, in the discussion. And except my political party, uh, no one of political party, serious political party. I was the president of pro-unionist party. Pro-unionist mean unification of Romania. And uh, no one uh, won because it's risky. Uh, every, everybody tried to put it uh, later, you know, to say that uh, not NATO is not... Uh, uh, popular not NATO what against uh, the cult cultural and historical memory of Moldovans. Why it happened because the Soviet Union coined this idea of NATO as a imperialist bloc and so on. And most of uh, many of Moldovans uh, use the Russian TV and they heard that they live in Russia and they are a Russian speaker and so on. Uh, that's why at the moment. Uh, Publicly, we don't speak about integration, but in reality, Moldova is so close to NATO that uh, I'm, uh, I wonder how it's happening. Moldova was invited to the summit of NATO. Moldova is helped military by NATO. Some country of NATO uh, helped Moldova with uh, um, strength, the resilience, and uh, defense and security. Moldovans military invited in Romania uh, to have common uh, actions with uh, NATO and Romanian soldiers. Uh, we have an office of NATO and Republic of Moldova. And uh, actually, after the change of mind of uh, Sweden and Finland, I think many people started to rethink the situation uh, regarding NATO membership and what mean to be NATO. First we have, we need a, a educational approach, first of all, a state kind of propaganda in order to explain what mean NATO and what is NATO behind these stereotypes of propaganda. Um, and of course, in the context of war in Ukraine, when everybody saw that only NATO can help and is uh, the only uh, uh, salvation. Many people uh, rethink uh, their opinion regarding NATO and what mean to be. And of course, it's a, it's an instinct of uh, survival, uh, maybe more than any over. And uh, of course, uh, what I attest uh, among common people is the confidence in NATO. All right, so please, Ekaterina. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Tsiko, um would probably be able to answer more. How is the US Congress's erratic support of Ukraine shaping Moldova's view of Western support for progress towards democratic progress? I will watch. And meantime, as uh, uh, Katerina, maybe you can address the question that the Surova asked, like about that view from ordinary citizens about um, that whole transition and getting closer to 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 uh, Euro-Atlantic integrations. Uh, is certainly, um, I believe that many uh, uh, Moldovans are are um, happy and they they are uh, pro um, pro European and um, I think that also mentioning that almost half of the population of Moldova lives abroad um, mostly in Europe uh, they certainly um, progress towards. Uh, that change of uh, adhering to NATO and European Union. Okay, um, 
Now, Dr. Octavian, this is an interesting question that uh, Steven, Steven Hernandez have asked, uh, the question about that, uh, as he calls it, erratic support. In other words, yeah, it does seem like, you know, this information and attention that Ekaterina mentioned is important regarding the, the Moldova, but it looks like it's kind of on and off, on and off. You know, we, we kind of will get a brief... Uh, um, splash of the news and information about uh, about Moldova, and then things will die down. And so, um, does that work well, or how do you assess this, as he calls it, erratic uh, support for uh, Ukraine for for Ukraine? How that shapes Moldova? Because let's say it, you know, we have a serious candidate for president in the United States who was who is talking about change of the United States foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian war. What I want to say, maybe I would be a bit tough in this time politician sometimes. <laughs> um, my observation is uh, Ukraine has some problems uh, with the control of weapons and the big problem with corruption. But of course, uh, this is an academic debate. And uh, I will stop here because many people understand what I mean. Uh, and uh, that's because uh, in the United States and Western world, there are some rumors about this, this uh, situation. And this uh, make people uh, to be, um, to approach this issue in a different way. Speaking even more or less, uh, harsh even to Ukrainians officials. But uh, what I want to say, this is, uh, this is of course a problem, but we should to have in mind the big problem, the big issue that mean to help Ukraine to resist. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, how much people uh, really understand uh, what is happening now in Ukraine. Because I'm traveling there, I was uh, I have been three times in Ukraine during the war in north and south in the center. The situation is quite critical because it's, it's a huge difference between Ukraine and Russia and keeping resistance in this war. And the last decision of President Zelensky are quite uh, important, and they show the limits of Ukraine in this war. So if uh, if uh, Western world will no, will not be helpful definitely to Ukraine, and Ukraine uh, will uh, not resist the problem, will be first uh, beside uh, Ukraine will be with Republic of Moldova. The south of uh, Ukraine, the south of Ukraine, it's a region which was in the Romanian control uh, previous to the Second World War. And is a is a territory with large uh, Russian-speaking minority and Romanian minority. Of course, Romanian minority is loyal to Ukrainian state because Romania is loyal to Ukraine. But this uh, region is uh, is unstable. Many Ukrainians told me that they ex very expected this region to. Uh, be defend to be um, ceded to Russian Federation and to help Russian Federation to establish power in south of Ukraine. This is the very important region of the uh, Danube River, which is the river uh, the, the access to Danube River and to the Black Sea. And if Russia will succeed, it Moldova will be defeated definitely because they will reach. Uh, this Transnistrian part, and they will join with uh, Russian troops in Transnistria region. Does At the moment, possibility for Romania to get involved? Yes, this is the moment when Romania and NATO should to decide what to do, because uh, there are Romanians in Ukraine also, not only in uh, in Republic of Moldova. In Ukraine live a half million of uh, Romanians. So 500,000 Romanians are living in Ukraine. 
beside the two millions of Romanians which live in Republic of Moldova. And so this is a big question. At the moment, Transnistria stayed quiet because Ukrainians say, if you will do a move, we will destroy everything which is connected to separatism. And there is a munition deposit in Kalbasna, which is a huge one. And if Ukraine destroy it, that will be an atomic explosion. And they know that Ukrainians has power to destroy all this facility. And they stayed quiet. But if Russia will reach this region of Odessa, it's not necessary to conquer all Ukraine. So Ukraine can resist to be to stay independent in the territory they succeed to defend. But if Russia will reach Odessa and south of Bessarabia, uh, Moldova will be defeated definitely. Okay. Um, so it is. Uh... Scary scenario, and we hope uh, that uh, things will end up differently. And uh, as I reminded to everybody, you know, Romania is a member of NATO. So as all eyes are basically looking into Poland, looks like things are much more complicated around the Black Sea Littoral, and this is where things may get really, really, really tense. Okay, any other questions, Katarina? At this moment, uh, NATO has in on the eastern flank uh, for 40,000 military in all these uh, six countries. 5,000 are based in Romania. Mm. All right. Um, Ekaterina, uh, uh, you want to, uh, I guess, ask a question or, or comment on something? Yes, but, uh, yes I just... Yes, uh, just to add um, to this question that I think um, United States support and European support is, it is crucial to that sentiment of security uh, to people. And it's, um, I think it's that that support is the only thing going for us as a nation uh, towards that progress. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it is crucial to ordinary people again. Okay, yeah, I was just to ask you uh, two things that uh, looked interesting to me as you were talking. You're talking about that uh, uh, history as a point of contention uh, when you were growing up, and then I'm making reflections on on my state of Florida, where history is also a point of contention, right? And which history will be taught and you know, uh, and uh, how that uh, teaching of history could be approached. And you are now teachers, so in the United States, you see how history, you, who would say that history will be such an important subject, <laughs> right? But uh, um, it is uh, quite an interesting thing to, to notice that all over the world, we are revisiting history and it is becoming a, a, a source of conflict instead of, so also source of, let's say, emancipation and source of movement forward. But I want to ask you, to what extent uh, um, uh, is Moldovan diaspora organized in the United States? I mean, do you, um, is Moldovan diaspora, does it have um, any way to, to, to provide more information about the country, about the aspiration of people? If anybody wants to reach Moldovian um, organizations or clubs or something, you know, can you point to us anything that exists in the United States? Uh, there are certainly many groups um, of Moldovan diaspora um, on, on Facebook, on um, different platforms. And um, I believe each state, at least major states, um, have organized groups, um, events um, that we celebrate holidays in Washington, D.C. is um, a large group of diaspora. And um, I know Chicago is probably the largest one for uh, Moldovan diaspora. So certainly is re within within a reach um, uh, uh, through uh, online platforms. Yeah, and and uh, this uh, diaspora in, in, in the United States, uh, do they uh, interact with Russian diaspora in the United States? How, how is that 
interactions because in my studies I have found that those same type of relations are usually recreated in those new new places wherever the diaspora moves. Is that the case with Moldovan diaspora as well? That is, um, I I think it's uh, there is that um, you, maybe a historical cultural connection I should say because even um, uh, Professor Tsiko mentioned how we celebrate two holidays in Moldova, two Christmases, two New Year's, and, and that connects us certainly to the Russian diaspora. Um, but as far as uh, I, I've known, for instance, many um, incidents where the latest uh, Ukrainian Russian invasion towards Ukrainian has divided um, that unification a lot. If uh, we talk about both both diasporas interacting, mm -hmm. that's that's uh, that's good. All right. So uh, one, we get... one more one more moment. Uh, many Moldovans go to the Russian Church, and this is mostly because there is no Romanian Church, Orthodox Church. So sometimes they interact with Russian through churches. And this uh, battle is also in uh, Western Europe, in Italy, for instance, there are Orthodox Russian churches, there are Romanian churches, there is Moldovan churches. And sometimes Moldovans, if they have no uh, Romanian or Moldovan, they go to Russian church. Okay, uh, Dr. Siku, I was to ask you, um, since you were there in Moldova, what is your assessment? You, you mentioned how when you run for president, that uh, that position of getting closer to NATO was not received well. But what is your position? Or what your assessment is now? Do you think that uh, people in Moldova across the ethnic lines are, are now more open for that possibility of Moldova getting closer to the West rather than East? Or, or that uh, division or that line is very firm uh, and, and nothing changed for, for since whatever. actually it's, it's fluid and it depends on the government so if uh, difficulty of government and the uh, propaganda will work then uh, we can assist with change of landscape so uh, we could have either a pro-russian president or a pro-russian parliament so uh, that's why we need a mobilization of uh, pro-european and pro-unionist uh, uh, segment into one and to secure a pro-European vector. Uh, the last elections, uh, almost 60% uh, uh, of Moldovans were pro-European. But in these local elections, only around 40%. So we lost 20% to different political actors, which are uh, very confused created by uh, Russian Federation, by oligarchs, which wanted to restore the previous situation. So uh, it's very it's very confusing and very risky to Republic of Moldova the next elections. Uh, that's why we pledged uh, for uh, the consolidation of uh, pro-Romanian and pro-European uh, parties into one single and to merge into the next elections as one single unit in order to have a constitutional majority in Republic of Moldova in Parliament. Why we need a constitutional majority in order to change some articles of constitution, including the one which is related to neutrality and the one which is connected to the provision of uh, Gagauz autonomy. We need a territorial reform and to cut this autonomy of Gagauz Republic, which is mostly pro-Russian. And to have uh, seven or eight counties equal, which will have only cultural uh, autonomy, but not territorial one. Because this uh, autonomy of Gagauz, which uh, Turkish uh, Shrist in it, but they support Russian Federation, their leaders are uh, pro-Russian, uh, so they uh, worked against the integration of Republic of Moldova. Uh, and all, all these issues are very important in terms of election, of course, uh, to have this power in order to not admit 
Veritarn of Putin is the majority in parliament. Imagine uh, what uh, harmful will be for Moldova, for European Union, for Romania, for Western world, to have a pro-Putinist uh, Republic of Moldova. Yeah, I understand. But, and so it is interesting so that that Turkish minority is more uh, Russian-oriented rather than Turk-oriented. Yes. Right? yes. And 70% 70 70 of Ukrainians are pro-Russian. In Moldova. In Moldova, yes. Yeah, because of that uh, ethnic ties to Slavic language. And... Yes, yes. They, they were russified. And Bulgarians, they are russified in the Republic of Moldova. We have 60,000 Bulgarians which are pro-Russian. Most of them are pro-Russian. They vote for uh, pro-Putinist parties. Well, uh, it this, is... go ahead. This is a fail also of pro-Europeans, but pro-Europeans, they uh, uh, deliberately, they don't go into this region considering that uh, it's uh, there is no reason to go there because you will have no voters. But European Union and Romania invested a, a lot of Gagauzia in this region. They helped, helped a lot. Uh, they modernize it, but anyway, they vote for Russian Federation. Is Turkey involved in that process? Yes, Turkish are involved largely. Many of uh, the investment at Turkish one, they open it, the cultural center, consulate, so on, but it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, you see how culture sticks. Very good. Okay, so uh, this is a fascinating story. As you all see, the country of Moldova is relatively small, but it is quite, quite complex a country and society with lots of issues. And we hope that these issues will be resolved in some way. And then we will have a peace. Unless there is any other question, I'm going to ask Dr. Surova to join and, and perhaps ask. And then if not, we're going to end soon. So please think of some concluding remarks. And so that because we are now about approaching 90 minutes. Go ahead, Dr. Sudova. Thank you, Mirsad. Uh, so uh, just just last question, because it really uh, uh, pulled my attention what Dr. Tiku, I'm sorry before I <laughs> renamed you. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, um, so uh, uh, you said something very interesting uh, that stuck with me. You said that uh, more seventy percent of Ukrainians in Moldova are pro-Russian, but do you have also Moldova has like the most uh, people that has fled from Ukraine to your country? So I'm wondering how the how the relations are uh, evolving be between these two types of Ukrainians. Yes. You are assuming that those who fled Ukraine are anti-Russians, Dr. Sudova. I'm warning you about that. Uh, I am not. I'm just asking. <laughs> yes, the problem is who fled from Ukraine. Sometimes uh, not only people which fled from uh, from uh, invasion, from uh, disaster. Some of them are uh, pro-Russian, but they they uh, they removed from Ukraine in order to not be took into the army. For instance, I, I was I witnessed the moment when these uh, new rich Ukrainians, they are quite rich, a lot of rich people from Ukraine came to Moldova on a huge, uh, uh, huge, uh, um, how to say, auto on this. Um, Cars and luxury car, cars. Yes, and, uh, and luxury hotels. And they, uh, they started to have parties, and uh, I was a witness when a lady in a one restaurant, she came to this uh, party and they say, are you ashamed uh, by situation? Your, your brothers died in Ukraine and you are sitting here and uh, making noise and uh, drink and so on. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting situation. We were uh, opening uh, so many uh, aspects of uh, sociological investment and, and, and discussion and research. What mean a country? What mean uh, an identity and so on, solidarity and so on? But the problem is uh, in the same way, uh, 
it's not a, I, I said the A and I should say B. Uh, many Ukrainians changed their minds. And I was uh, in discussion with uh, the leaders of the Rival Council of Ungen. He's Ukrainian, but he is in Socialist Party. And this guy, he was uh, pro-Putinist, he was uh, pro-Russian, he was close to the Don, this socialist leader of Putinist. And when he saw on TV, he approached me and say, uh, I can understand what is happening, but I, uh, I support my Ukrainian brothers. And I was shocked by his declaration. And I know that many Ukrainians changed their mind after this invasion. They uh, are around 30%, maybe 40% changed and they uh, started to rethink their Ukrainian identity. Because uh, previous to this situation, they were a pro-Russian, uh, even Russian speaker and even Russian uh, supporters in, in political terms. So uh, war changed many things. We don't know what is the future of uh, Ukrainian refugees. We have around, uh, we had half million, we have now around 100,000. So it's, uh, I don't know what is next for them. Uh, they will return home. They will stay in Moldova. Uh, we Moldova provided citizenship with another interesting category of Russian refugees. And we know, uh, as the president of Czech Republic said, we have to monitor the Russians who fled from uh, Russia and, uh, during this war, because not many of them should be agents and put in the, the cover to work uh, for Putinism in the next future. So mm -hmm. a lot of problems in, in this context, but uh, we have a short time for discussions. Yeah, this is just an opening uh, part and we promise to continue. We are very glad as Miri to have now uh, contact with uh, Dr. Tsiku. And uh, it is a, a fascinating uh, land where minorities interact in various ways. And it is a case also, as we can see, where minority can be the one oppressing the majority. It's usually we think of minority being in a position to, you know, uh, maybe yes. have their rights denied. But here we can see how minority can be quite, um, quite powerful and, and in a position to maybe uh, in a way, oppress the majority. Well, uh, Ekaterina, any concluding uh, remarks? No, just I'm I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Again, thank you so much uh, for um, letting me speak today from um, an ordinary um, point of view of uh, Moldovan citizens and Moldovan diaspora. Um, and thank you, Dr. Mirzad and Ms. Surova for putting this together today. This is awesome. If every Moldovian is quite, an, uh, uh, every ordinary Moldovian is quite educated like you are, <laughs> that is a, a country of the future, right? A person who speaks five languages is quite extraordinary, but uh, we said let's kind of use that approach. Uh, well, thank you all very much for joining us. I think uh, it was a, quite an interesting presentation. We learned a lot about that small country. We promised that we will provide more information. Dr. Tsiku have said that maybe in the future he may send us some uh, things that we can share with with um, uh, Miri um, uh, email list so that we, uh, we, have, we may have a discussion on Transnistrian separatism exclusively. What is going there? Because it's very, very, it's, it's the closest to European Union uh, frozen conflict. And it's... That, that, that is quite, quite uh, welcome. We will be happy to hold this discussion. And perhaps maybe, Dr. Tsik, you can help us find somebody from that region to yes. join. And yes. so we, we can have it and obviously, um, you know, learn more about this fascinating country. Uh, but we have to end at this point. We are at the 90 minutes mark. And I am thanking again everybody for being with us. And I hope we see you soon. We have an interesting conversation about the Roma, marginalization of Roma population in Slovakia. 
then toward the end of the month we have an expert who is going to talk about Nigeria and then we will uh, inform you about the rest of it and then hopefully I do think that there will be a fascinating discussion to talk about Transnistria in particular and Dr. Tsiku already mentioned that he will be with us to repeat it. Thank you again all. We'll see you soon.